I'd like to welcome everybody here to this latest episode of The Green Left Show. My name's Alex Bainbridge, and I'm, uh, I'd like to acknowledge at the outset that we're recording this show on stolen Aboriginal land. I'm coming to you from Jagera Turbul country, along with my guest here, Max Chandler Mather, and our other guest, Sam Wainwright, is uh, over in Noongar country in WA. I also just wanted to say at the outset, if you like the work that we do, please become a Green Left supporter. It's the number one way of supporting our project. It's uh, plans start from just $5 a month. There's a link in the description below. And it is the best way to both get the material that we produce as well as to support the project that we're, uh, that we're, that we're on about. Now, today we're going to be discussing the question of strategy. And as I said, we've got two guests, uh, Max chandler Mather from The Greens and Sam Wainwright from Social Science. And I have long maintained that what the Australian left needs is a political formation that incorporates the best elements both of the socialist left and of the Greens. And I think actually it's in that sense it actually is quite fortuitous to have these two guests with us because I think in their own way they each represent, they each come from among the best of, of each of the each of the traditions that we're talking about. But I guess to get to the nuts and bolts of this question of strategy, it's very easy at the outset to acknowledge some things like, for example, that the Australian Greens are the best political formation within the Australian Parliament, alongside, say, our progressive Tasmanian independent Andrew Wilkie. And it's easy to acknowledge that if the Greens policies were implemented in full, we would all be much better off, both the policies that we would uh, be you know, acting under in, in the Australian government and also the strength of the progressive movement. Uh, these things are easy to acknowledge, but I guess for those of us activists that have been around the block a few times, we're very familiar with a capitalist ruling class that is very experienced at maintaining their rule. The corporate elite have got so many mechanisms to, to try and, you know, obviously to keep their preferred political parties in power, uh, to shape the policies of the, of their, of the two major capitalist parties, uh, to keep them in line in, in numerous ways. And so it's not enough to just put forward uh, progressive ideas that might seem admirable on their first glance. The question of strategy goes beyond that quite, you know, to quite some, you know, to quite some extent. So I began this discussion by posing the question to Max Chandler Mather, uh, who represents um, not only the Australian Greens, but I guess uh, perhaps it is fair to say a certain current within the Australian Greens. Uh, and I asked him, like, to how much, to what extent does the, does the strategy that he advocates overlap with the strategy of the socialist left? In particular, this question of anti-capitalism. To what extent is he uh, wanting to push for a movement that can go beyond the bounds of the capitalist system? I think a lot in the sense that, you know, I, I've said this before in an interview uh, with uh, Tom Ballard, was written up for Jacobin, that, you know, I think a lot of what we campaign for has been described by a lot of people as democratic socialism or socialism. Like, sometimes I lean away from those terms because I think they have a lot of cultural and political baggage that's not actually what we're about and are often used by, in particular, actually, the Labor Party as red-baiting. You know, Albo did it very um, cruelly against Jim Casey, Dan and Grainler, and uh, I think the left loses when we get, or progressive left loses when we get engaged in culture wars about these terms. Our strength, and it has been for hundreds of years, is that uh, we want to emancipate the large majority of working people from the sort of cruelties and um, inequalities that capitalism produces and where and material improvements in their lives that can only be won by collective action. And that is inherently and has been for a long time appealing, cutting away all the other cultural baggage. And so in that sense, you know, on practical terms, universal public housing or, you know, rolling out a free breakfast and lunch meal for every state school student, that sort of decommodification of a lot of the aspects of our lives, that universal basic services, rapidly expanding our public health system, renationalizing um, and democratizing our energy system, um, you know, uh, bringing into public ownership a large section of our public uh, pharmaceut or pharmaceutical industry, that those on the in of themselves would be described by a lot of people as socialism or democratic socialism. And so I think in that sense, there is a lot of overlap, um, uh, certainly in sort of the goals, which, which is that, you know, capitalism produces a lot of uh, poverty, alienation, um, disconnection, um, and individualization, fragmentation, and loneliness, and, you know, a lot of the sort of social ills, and that the only way to address those is to um, fundamentally change the way our economy um, and political system work. 
Do you have any comments you want to make, Sam, on this um, question of goals for the progressive left? Well, I think probably the place to start is with the existential question that's facing all of us, and that is the possibility of runaway global warming, uh, yes. and really, truly catastrophic warming. Um, I mean, three, four, five degrees, these sorts of figures really presuppose the end of human civilization as we know it. I mean, maybe not the end of human life, but certainly the end of human civilization as we know it. Um, and that would also bring with it, I suspect, probably the most traumatic and violent episode in human, in human history. So uh, if you can see the reality of that threat, then I think the next thing that follows is that capitalism is not able to solve that problem, that capitalism the system that created the problem is, is not, is not going to provide the solution. And I think that certainly means breaking the back of capitalism. And look, by that, I'd, you know, I don't, us in social science, we don't suggest that there needs to be some rapid transition where sort of a 1930s Soviet Union style transition where every single, every single enterprise and small business in a country like Australia would be, need to be brought into democratic public ownership. But we certainly do need to do that with what we, we would call the commanding heights of the economy. Um, now, Max sort of charted out some, some of those, uh, what some of those things are. Um, I would say it would have to include um, the big poor banks and the mining industry as well. So we can actually free up and redirect that wealth um, and, and start creating a society that lives in peace with the planet um, and is, is, is dignified and fundamentally, fundamentally more democratic than the one we have now. I, I think agreeing on that is easy enough. The real, the, the, the real nub of the question is how do we get there? Um, and I think there's... I can't see there's any way around the fact that any even modest steps in that direction are going to need to be backed up by a very sort of politicised, engaged and mobilised population that are, are prepared to defend that, that, that idea and um, because it would face the fiercest, of, res fiercest of, of resistance you can imagine. I mean, living in Western Australia, which is re really, I mean, I guess like Queensland, is very much a mining state. And I mean, if you think, away, think about the way the... Um, the corporate media, particularly here in WA, just went bananas when um, Kevin Rudd uh, proposed his rather mild-mannered mild -mannered, um, mining super profit tax. I mean, that is just a small inkling of what we would be up against if, if we tried to, you know, even begin to go down that path and implement the sorts of things that, that Max talked about, which I support wholeheartedly, but um, that's, we should be under no illusions that um, it's what we have to do, but but we will have to see, I think we'd have to see a mobilisation of Australian people on a scale uh, that we've never seen before in our lives. Mm. We encountered that opposition to the mining industry during the recent state election, where um, the Queensland Resource Council um, split actually over the, uh, their fight with the Queensland Greens when it dawned on them that we at least had a shot of winning, getting into the balance of power in Queensland State Parliament, which would have been disastrous for the um, mining lobby. Uh, to the point where a senior journalist, um, I won't say from which paper, called me and told me that there had been a meeting of shareholders in London about the QRC strategy, about going after the Greens directly. Um, and even on that small scale, it was interesting because um, it demonstrated to me that I think uh, you're right, um, Sam, that there's a lot of, they wield a lot of power, but there's se severe limits to that power. A lot of the attacks and um, rhetoric used by the QRC, the sort of mobilisation of the Curie Mail and the sort of corporate media, where at one point there really became a pincer movement between the QRC and them against the Queensland Greens around our policy to raise mining royalties from 7% to 35% um, uh, and raise something like $60 billion over four years was when you went door knocking and we, we had the capacity at that point to talk to thousands of people every weekend, mobilise hundreds of volunteers and threaten the Labor Party's, you know, until that, up until that point, safest seat in Queensland history. Um, you rarely encountered, you were never, very rarely fed back the attack lines that the QRC mobilised. I think they were there latently, but um, it's, I agree that they wield, clearly wield a lot of power, but I think they also wield a lot of power in the sense that they are inextricably linked with the existing political establishment in Australia, you know, via lobbyists and donations, but also social relationships with the Labor and Liberal Party, and they wield their power that way. But we should also understand that those political institutions are severely disconnected, hollowed out 
and you know, I've talked about this a lot um, in terms of hollowing out trade union membership and, and the sort of disconnection of the Labor Party from civil society. As a result, I would argue the Labor Party usually who plays the role of that disciplining force or conservatising force on the Australian population has increasingly losing its ability to do that. And we, we experienced that in a micro form in South Brisbane when we won that state seat, where the QRC ended up spending half a million dollars just to try and stop us in South Brisbane, and they didn't even get close. Um, and that's obviously an inner city seat. It's very progressive for us. But our, our experience and the feedback that we got, there's absolutely no reason why that strategy rolled out at a larger scale wouldn't also work. I felt it was an interesting microcosm that there are limits politically, not economically. Like, they can withdraw capital and... There's economic fiscal waterboarding that I think they could engage in that would be far more effective than political tactics, which I actually think they're relatively limited. Well, actually, maybe can we move on to that? Like, can you perhaps talk to us about the strategy that you pursue and advocate for uh, for the Greens? And like, you know, and I guess in particular, you did a, a recent forum on, you know, uh, 18 years to a Greens government, a provocative title, perhaps. I mean, yes. perhaps do you want to outline in summary form how you see the strategy for for change that you're pursuing at the moment? Sure. So maybe in very basic terms, in terms of the political landscape, we feel like this um, phenomenon of anti-politics or distrust in the political establishment, um, you know, in material terms, which is that collapse in trade union membership and civil society organisations that once gave weight to traditional 20th century politics have hollowed out. As a result, people don't really have or trust, have any connection to uh, politics anymore or trust it at all. And that has left a very weak and anemic political class in Australia who exist mostly, I would argue, um, retain a lot of their power via sort of um, inertia, really, um, that there's no competing political force that can replace them. You know, the old is dying and the new cannot, cannot be born. Um, and uh, into that space, we have rolled out a political strategy that um, at its most basic is um, via the Queensland Greens and the Australian Greens going at, on a mass scale, going door to door and talking about the material issues that affect people's lives and winning them to a, that sort of transformative politics. Now, we know that there's a vast majority of people are in, like close to a majority of people in Queensland already share that sort of anti-establishment politics via social surveys and things like that. But they uh, aren't drawn to it because they don't think there's a political force that can win or they don't see have hope or of a viable alternative to reaching that. And so our strategy is to build a political structure and movement capable of um, eventually rolling out South Brisbane and Griffith style campaigns across the country, in a majority of seats across the country. And in terms of our growth, volunteer recruitment, our ability to go, our, the statistics that we've garnered and stats that we've garnered via our ability to go and say in this Griffith campaign, we're, end, we're probably going to end up having uh, 32,000 one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. We know roughly statistically how many votes that will transfer into. And we think that as a result of previous campaigns where on roughly one in two people we speak to will end up voting for us, um, that there's no, the only limit to our ability to build that political structure um, is uh, our capacity to organise. And the growth right now where we've gone from the Gabba Ward in 16 to where we are now, on that current rate of growth, within 18 years, there's not, it's not unreasonable to suggest that we would be competing um, to be a, ma a majority partner in, for instance, a Labor-Greens coalition, or at the very least, the, one of the biggest forces in Parliament, which sounds, um, which sounds enormously ambitious if it not for the fact that uh, we've seen our strategies work in South Brisbane and the Gabba Ward and in Maywa, um, where we've won those seats for the first time, and Griffith, where we got the biggest swing for the Greens in the country and where we think we've got a good chance of winning here. That's not to say it's just about door knocking. We're also um, engage long form in political education for our volunteers, where we run training sessions, not just on how to talk about changing people's votes, but also thinking more broadly about politics, why we need public ownership, for instance. And often a lot of the people that engage in these training sessions, hundreds of people, are people who've never been involved in politics before in their lives. They're nurses and teachers and childcare workers. And they're people that wouldn't describe themselves as left, but people that would describe themselves as sharing a lot of the politics that I've described. And I find that um, uh, escaping the cultural baggage, I think, of the um, quote unquote left is really crucial because for a lot of people we too talk, the divide isn't left or right. Um, the divide is between the establishment and anti-establishment. And I find that hegemonizing that and capturing that for a progressive force is far more powerful. Um, 
And so obviously in tandem with that, every time we win in a state MP's office, we engage in a lot of community organising, whether it be in public housing or against local developments, and that gives us weight in areas we've already won. And so that's sort of our political and strategic trajectory at the moment. And what's exciting and why I think we keep growing uh, is because it keeps working. And for the first time, people who've gone to rallies and you go to a rally and you leave and you wonder what the hell just happened. Um, nothing really positive changed. People are coming, knocking on doors. They found they just shifted two or three votes. They think about the fact that we we're about to have 32,000 of those conversations and they think, oh, oh, cool. This is a strategy that works and is like compelling. And like, and I, I, I'm talking to people about just the issues that affect their lives. And I've just watched this guy vote. He's voted Labor all his life switch his vote to the Greens because I talked about dental and to Medicare and how he couldn't afford to pay for the dentist last year. Um, and it's, uh, it gives, I think we almost deal and trade in hope in that sense with a lot of people who otherwise share our values but um, feel disenchanted with all of the other sort of strategic options on the table at the moment. Just to extend that, I mean, you talked about like a sort of a South Brisbane or a Gabba style campaign. Can you like talk about what that, can you talk in more detail what that means? Like, how is that different to other campaigns? And, and secondly, I guess um, one uh, question that people might ask in response to what you've just said then is the question about parliamentarism. And yep. um, I guess, how do you see that connecting with, you know, uh, grassroots organising beyond simply door knocking for the Greens? Yeah, great. Um, so in terms of a campaign structure, maybe I'll describe the Griffith campaign. So we have split the electorate up into four sections. Each section is assigned a full-time paid organiser, um, who then under them has probably uh, collectively all up maybe about 200 really committed volunteers and recruit new people into them. Every weekend uh, we have a, at the moment about nine door knocking teams, each door knocking team, so three under each of our organisers um, on average and then they sort of shift around. And those door knocking teams consist of about 10 to 15 people and every weekend they'll go out and knock on doors and it's about reaching um, targets essentially of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. Those conversations are collated and fed back up into our sort of central campaign and we talk about how we shift the way we talk about things and stuff like that. Uh, and in tandem with that we're running a community organising arm of the campaign. So currently we're helping a neighbourhood uh, save a local park from a developer who wants to build a four-lane road through it. We're organising in Carina Heights where we're helping some residents resist the Department of Housing from evicting them. So we've like from a strategic but also political perspective, we believe it's important to build up community organising at the same time as a running the field campaign. The field campaign feeds back uh, issues that are going on in the community back into the field campaign arm of the campaign and then they go out and help organise people. Parliamentarism, yeah, I mean, we, like in the short term, obviously our goal is to get into the balance of power and maybe we'll talk about that later and that's really important. But in tandem with that, it's for us, parliamentary parliamentarism or parliamentary politics is a is a part, but only a part of our strategy. The second part is that we found when we win MPs' offices, they provide almost a beachhead, a staging ground to go and run permanent, well-resourced community campaigns in the areas in which we win. And we think that that allows for exponential growth because once we win a, a, a state or federal MP, in particular state MPs or councils in Queensland, you know, two full-time paid staff and um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in wages, that allows us to sort of lock down that area in terms of helping whatever those sort of community campaigns, which gives us the capacity to push on and push for more things and build the overall capacity of the party, both in terms of skills, organising capacity, connections to the community, networks that we've built up, um, that allows us to wield real power outside of parliamentary politics. In fact, we think a lot of our power comes from that and not parliamentary politics at the moment. And that, um, for us, medium term, is really where we think we're going to be able to build our capacity as a party because we recognise that just getting enough MPs in Parliament as a, you know, internationally is proved. Running up against the mining industry, in particular in Australia, or the political and economic establishment, we're not going to beat them just because we have a majority of MPs. Much bigger political forces than ours have lost. And so we want in tandem to be able to build up, I suppose, the mass nature of the party in, while we're almost a sustainable growth. We're not going to, I think, emerge in the same way as a Syriza or a Podemos, but I think that's to, to our advantage because we're almost filling out the structures of the party and the civil society organising that we're doing at the same time. So I mean, perhaps, Sam, do you want to make some comments about the strategy of the socialist left? I mean, obviously, we are 
much smaller than the Greens in terms of representation and also numbers and percentage of the vote, etc. Um, but I mean, I, I, I guess your experience on council, even just being one vote, you've actually been able to win some things and see Bolton in uh, in Melbourne, a similar kind of approach. Like, can you explain about how that works? And I guess more broadly, how you see as the, the what do you see as a socialist strategy for for winning, you know, practical change and in fact government? Sure. Look, I mean, the first thing I want to say is it does sound really fascinating what um, Queensland Greens have been doing there around Brisbane, and I'll be fascinated to see how it emerges and and even how it's able to to, to spread beyond beyond Brisbane. Um, I mean, we certainly work very closely with friends in the Greens here over West, but I, you know, as an outside observer, the, the, the CI stuff, the stuff I see coming from the Brisbane Greens is, 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 is a lot more left wing. Um, and I dare say sometimes closer to us than probably the, the, the general sort of messaging um, that I see from the Greens elsewhere. Yeah, look, there's a few points um, I wanted to sort of respond to um, and, and work my way to, the, to, to, to your question there. There, Alex, just on this question of sort of uh, culture wars and how you label yourself on, and, and all that kind of thing. I mean, look, certainly we're not we're not hung up on the notion that you need to be, you know, label yourself as socialist, for instance. We're, we're pretty um, we're pretty pragmatic on that on that question. Uh, what, what you do is more important than what you what, what, what you call yourself. And um, if, if you're doing the right thing, your enemy are going to throw dirty labels at you regardless. So that's that's <laughs> that's just. You know, but that, that's just part of the battle that you have to face. Um, it is interesting, though, when you look at the sort of the kind of generational shift and, and, and polls showing that um, how much young people in the United States identify as socialists nowadays. I mean, what they might mean by that, who knows? I think I think there's a lot of lot, lot of variation with that. The other thing that I was sort of curious to um, for, 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 for Max to respond to, if, 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 if he wishes, is this notion of the Greens um, wanting to hold the balance of power and mm. form government with Labor. I mean, mm. I'm, I'm fond of telling people that actually the Labor Party and Liberal Party have the balance of power in Parliament. I mean, if you look at, <laughs> if you look at their voting record, you know, 80, 90 percent of the time, you know, for, for all the, the huff and puff and theatre and, and the way they amplify their, their, their differences, um, the majority of the time they vote the same way. And we know that they're on a unity ticket with the Australian fossil fuel industry, for instance. So, um, I don't know. My sort of, I always, um, I, 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 when, whenever I hear the Greens or anyone talk about, oh, you know, the balance of power, I always want to make that point. And I wonder too whether, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any, like, it would be a good thing if, if, if the Greens did um, have the balance of power, um, if you want to call it that. Of course, mm -hmm. that would be, a but, um, and I, I've got no doubt that in that situation, the Greens would, it would the Greens should support a, a, a minority Labor government over an, over a minority Liberal government, mm. um, but if that's a given, it's not really a bargaining chip either. Um, I don't think you know. You know, there's there's no point making threats you're not prepared to carry through. So mm. you know, if you don't get, get get what you want out of Labor, you're really going to support a Liberal government. And I wonder too whether um, this idea of wanting seats, you know, wanting to, to form government with Labor, um, seems to me to be a rather fraught one, given how committed they are to the neoliberal project. Certainly you'd support a minor, minority Liberal government, but taking junior cabinet posts in a minority Labor government seems to me a path to uh, a path to doom, basically. But just the other yeah. thing I, I think it's worth us thinking about is, um, look, us in social science, we've, we've never had a kind of a, how would you put it, uh, you know, a kind of a dogmatic or, or static way of conceiving the interplay between grassroots struggle um, and breakthroughs in, in the parliamentary arena, arena. One can reinforce the other and, and mm. it can open the way for the other. There's, 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 no question, there's no question about that. But having said that, though, one is primary and one is secondary in, in the sense that, you know, to overcome the, the, the power of capital, you know, we're going to need mobilised mass, you know, mass movements in the workplaces, in the streets, in communities, uh, as I said earlier, on, on a scale that we haven't we, ha we haven't seen before, and in historical terms, I think about the history of the old Communist Party, um, which, you know, for all its its sort of weaknesses and its well, in, in particular, its its the, the fact that it had an uncritical attitude towards the old Soviet Union, no, nonetheless, it grew to become a mass force in Australian politics through the Great Depression. You know, it, it was it was in fighting for the rights of the unemployed. Uh, it was off the back of that that it became a mass, a mass organisation with, with, you know, with, with, with roots in the community and with an ability to push forward social struggles um, that, that really changed Australian society. And, you know, 
in their heyday that they still represented more than sort of the Greens or Social Alliance combined, if you know what I mean, far and away. And I think, so that's, I think that, you know, the thing that I think is really important is that every, every step forward in terms of in representative democracy, whether it's at a local council level or, or, or on state and federal parliaments, is, is going to have to be fuelled by, 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 by grassroots struggle. Um, if, if, it, if it doesn't, if it remains isolated from those things, uh, you know, if, if those things fizzle out, then I think the, the parliamentary representation will tend to be pushed, pu will, will tend to be pushed backwards. That's my, that's my sense of it. And um, certainly as someone who um, is, you know, is envious of some of the resources and power, and, and power of initiative that the Greens, <laughs> that the Greens have, certainly what you have in, 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 in South East Queensland, I, my, my sense is that they're, that the, the Greens could be doing more to help, really help drive forward and and, and organise grassroots struggle. I mean, it's good to hear the ones that, that Max talked about around the public housing stuff in, in particular, because I think that has really, really helped, you know, break away the image of the Greens as just being nice in the city middle class kind of people, which I know the mm. Greens, and I know that's not, I know that's not, you know, in, true of the Greens in all in, in all cases, and clearly, in clearly not the case, you know, of, of, of how Brisbane Greens see themselves. But I think. My sense is that is that, that needs to be generalised a, a lot more to be able to push forward. Um, but the, the you know the, the 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 sort of path towards growth that Max is talking about is, is not quite so smooth and you know um, unbroken um, as 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 you might hope it w w will be. Like I think it's really going to have to be predicated on some really you know gritty gritty struggles, which which I hope happen. You know. Um, yeah, I'm, just to respond to that, I think on the outset, I completely agree, Sam. I don't think, like, well, the ACT, for instance, there are Greens ministers, um, uh, but I don't think they're in cabinet. Um, but I tend towards the view that supporting a minority Labor government but not going into government with Labor is a much um, better outcome, partly because I share, um, your, share your analysis of the Labor Party being... Um, uh, uh, a journalist once described to me the Labor Party in Queensland, for instance, as a wholly owned subsidiary of Santos. Um, uh, and the links between the Labor Party and the fossil fuel industry are uh, like impossible to ignore. And often I think the Labor Party functions very effectively at capturing progressive dissent and um, managing it uh, in a way um, that uh, uh, destroys its progressive potential. Um, in favour of capital in Australia. And the Greens certainly would be at risk of being captured in that way. We're not nearly big enough to resist that in a way. So I think minority makes a lot of sense. And I think everyone is um, realistic about how much you could gain in that situation. Um, and I think it's important both politically and strategically to be seen to be ho still holding Labor to account in that situation and being separate from the Labor Party is crucial. Uh, and... Um, at least pushing them in some direction and making it not completely awful, but at the same time recognising this is also a long game about building power over the long term. I think getting some concessions, for instance, on stopping, uh, on, on addressing some of the worst aspects of our fossil fuel industry and addressing climate change in some way, and also um, pushing them on some things around building public housing and dental into Medicare, I think you probably could get some gains in those areas, but no, it's a much more long-term project. And then I think, yeah, I, I mean, I very much agree on the building those social movements um, uh, and interacting with them, especially breaking free of the images of the Greens as this um, comfortable middle class party. And I was asked this question um, uh, by Tom Ballard about, oh, do the other Greens a mass working class movement? It's like, obviously we're not. Um, and but I think that that's starting to change, at least in Brisbane. And um, a lot of our work now, we've sort of described us, because we're still a young project. The Greens are a relatively old party now, like older by, uh, well, young by Australian political standards, but old. But we, as a sort of a strategy and a project, emerged on the shoulders of giants, obviously, and people have done work before in 2016. And so we have been finding our feet for the last few years. Like, we've got some wins on the board, but um, a lot of our thinking now is turning to how to help build up, I suppose, um, organic working class movements um, in Brisbane and across Queensland and how to relate to the radical or um, uh, anti-establishment sections of the trade union movement, in particular with um, unions like the QTU. 
where we can turn our capacity to organise at a mass scale now, I'd argue, and that capacity could and should be used for also intervening in trade unions in the way that the Communist Party used to do, um, and uh, and also building up, I suppose, organic, uh, helping to build up organic social movements while being knowledgeable that I like I'm not necessarily like I don't really believe in voluntarism in the sense that I don't think we can just create them out of the blue we can relate to them and help build them uh, and w a lot of our work we see is building the structure of an almost the um, infrastructure of a mass party in anticipation of social movements exploding and being able to give them support and resources. If we have 10 to 15 MPs who can represent the voices of that social movement in parliament while also providing the um, for instance, 10 to 15 MPs, MPs in terms of resources is tens of millions of dollars of resources and staffing time that we could just turn like a machine to help build those things up when they come. And um, we've seen explosions of social movements in Europe where those political structures haven't existed. Uh, and I think having those ready is really important as well. I wanted to turn to the question of um, uh, of parliamentarians and how we uh, how we you know, relate to them. I guess in particular, um, one thing the question is, I mean, Parliament has been a notoriously corrupting institution oh, yeah. for individuals. If you look back over the last hundred years or more, yes. uh, all around the world, it's been a notoriously corrupting in, you know, institution. I think I disagree with the idea that uh, it's inevitable that anyone who goes into Parliament will be corrupted. Uh, I think that's clearly not true. Um, but it nevertheless does require a considerable, uh, you know, practical and uh, you know, and conscious approach towards sort of dealing with that. And I guess also maybe while talking about that, Max, you could maybe, um, you know, I mean, I think, I mean, Greens parliamentarians have a long record of actually supporting campaigns in the sense of coming along and speaking at rallies and, yes. um, you know, and giving a voice to campaigns in that sense. But I think less so in the sort of practical, oh, yeah. um, uh, you know, organising and consciously sort of building up those sort of mass, mm. the mass campaigns. Maybe do you want to talk more about the role of parliamentarians? How do we keep them, yep. you know, how okay. do we keep them loyal to the to the mass base that elected them and to the, the progressive agenda they got elected on? Yeah. And, um, and, and how, you know, how do we use them in the best way to actually build that, you know, progressive movement? Oof, a tough question and one we're grappling with. I, um, in fact, we had these active discussions going on in the party at the moment about that. And... Um, because obviously the challenge we have is that we have, a, I, the Greens, while I think emerged out of some sort of proto-social movements in Australia, the nuclear peace movement and environment movement, um, when it's not like the trade union movement that created the politi their political arm that could discipline Labor MPs through the 20th century by just deselecting them and picking other people. Um, and so that is a challenge for us. And we've seen what happens, yeah, as I said, you've seen what happens with, say, Podemos MPs or Syriza MPs in Greece. Um, really tough. I think part of it is that the more that we can establish a party where victories are built off the back of, and I mean the parliamentary victories, built off the back of last large based member driven and volunteer driven campaigns, the more capacity that the movement and the electors and the party will have to hold MPs to account in a very basic sense that you will not get elected if you do not continue to represent the views and um, wishes and drives and strategies of the people that got you elected in the first place. Moving beyond essentially the personality-based politics that has existed, I would argue, as the, social, as the sort of social weight of politics has collapsed. It's been replaced in many ways by personalities. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think there's that component, which is really important. S democratic structures within the party uh, I think are important, they're limited, I think, because parliamentary politics has a real way of riding roughshod over the structures of political parties when push comes to shove. Um, and so I think this is where our slow growth in comparison to other parties is helpful because I think by in 18 years, for instance, you know, um, hopefully we've had some victories along the way. <laughs> we'll certainly need them around the climate. Um, if we've got, if we've built a slow or sort of a slow organic growth of a party that I, along the way has built up large, a really large membership base with the capacity to discipline MPs and uh, social movements that relate to the party but only relate to it uh, as long as it represents their views, then I think that 
uh, will help a lot. And then in terms of how MPs use, but look, I should say, I don't have the answers to that. Um, we have some ideas and we're thinking about it a lot and we worry about it a lot um, because uh, our political project and our view is tenuous and being able to give it enough weight and strength is one of our, that it doesn't just fall over because a personality changes their political views is one of our main um, worries and thoughts at the moment. So we've thought about it, haven't got all the solutions. Um, in terms of how MPs use their resources, uh, I think John O3 has provided some fan bloody tastic examples in practical terms, using his MP salary to provide resources. And Deeping Creek has used his personality to give that Deeping Creek, for instance, which is a, a group of Aboriginal First Nations traditional owners out near Ipswich, um, for those outside of Brisbane, um, listening who uh, uh, series developers want to bulldoze their land and turn it into a development and it's on a sacred burial site and an old Aboriginal mission site with a lot of painful memories and history. And, uh, you know, providing office staff resources to help do practical things like get protest permits, liaise with the police, liaise with trade unions to help bring them out there, you know, help, instrumental, I think, in helping to get the CFMEU out there along with a lot of other comrades outside of the Greens. Um, and so that struggle, I think, is a really good microcosm. Um, to give you another practical example, um, one of our plans that we've already set in place if we do win Griffith is to run a trial free breakfast and lunch program in a school. So commit um, a lot of our volunteers' time. We've got, we've, got, we've got, in terms of not just door knocking, but people who actually want to do something, we've got a thousand people right now in Griffith who will do something, letterbox, um, knock on doors. There's no reason why those resources can't be used in tandem with, you know, the hundreds of thousands of dollars a federal MP gets in resources to start running that mutual aid stuff. Um, but not just in terms of helping that community, because in Carina Heights in particular, there's a lot of social housing and, and I would say low levels of poverty that could be helped with running a free school breakfast and lunch program. But as a test, um, uh, as a pilot to demonstrate to the, you know, rest of the country and um, help us win political debates as well about rolling out a universal free school breakfast and lunch program. And so I think those strategies, which we're very ambitious about and keen to roll out if we do win is another example. And that is very much in the tradition, I would say, of the German Social Democrats and say the Italian Communist Party, where you become part of the social fabric. You know, the Castle de Popolos, the houses of the people in Italy that were provided cheap meals and you could just go there and um, if you ever read The Taylor of Ulm, um, uh, which is a fantastic sort of bi half biography um, of a very senior Italian um, Communist Party member, that concept that you can just go and get a cheap, cheap, you know, pastor and then go and talk about politics is, um, and becoming part of the social fabric of people's lives, I think is also a medium term goal for us and where MPs officers can play a big part in that. Sam, do you have any comments about this uh, question of you know, um, elected representatives uh, connection to mass movement and the, and the parties that elected them, the movements that elected them? Look, in the first instance, I don't think there's any, there's no absolute guarantee of stopping um, mm -hmm. sort of, the, you know, the wealth and focus and all that sort of stuff around parliamentary positions that are, you know, corrupting people and moving people to the right. Um, but I think there's a couple of things that you can do to try and prevent that from happening. I mean, in the first instance, of course, is that the, the parliamentary the parliamentary caucus um, needs to be subordinate subordinate to the to, to the to the wider party organisation or movement that it's that, that it's come from. Uh, that is to say, the, the direct opposite of the Labor Party. So we know with the Labor Party, essentially, the the parliamentary caucus of the Labor Party has a free hand to do whatever it wants. So, you know, rank and file members can. Can, they bust, can bust their ass to try and change Labor Party policy, but at the end of the day, the, the parliamentary caucus is also free to free, free, free to ignore it and actually owes its first loyalty to to Australian capitalism, not 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 even to the, to the Labor Party itself. I, I I would say, I think, and that's you know something else that, that you can do. A, a practical thing is, for instance, for your to to just say, look, all our MPs are just going to take an average workers' wage and donate the rest of the money back to back to the movement mm -hmm. in, in the way that Mac talked about. It's, it sounds like Jonathan does. I think that's that's he a very does. good thing as well because then then it makes it very clear you're not you're not going into Parliament to um, to, to, to to feather your nest. Um, you, you're going there because you want to do the hard work, you know, and you want to represent people in struggle. I think the the thing you know even more even more so than the the the, the sort of um, the financial bribes and all that sort of stuff that you could say that that you know having a parliamentary salary um, could represent 
is, is, is also the media focus as well, because um, whether you like it or not, under, under sort of capitalist media, the, the, they're, they're going to treat the parliamentary representatives as the leaders, regardless of whether, if, you know, whether they're the leaders or not, if you take what I mean. I mean, we come from a tradition that says, well, no, you know, the, your parliamentary representatives are just servants of the movement, you know, no more important than anyone, anyone else. But because you've got that access to the media, it does, it does create the potential for, for the people who have access to, me, to, to media to influence the debate within their own organisation more so than others do in, a, in an unhealthy manner. And there's no, there's no, you know, all, you know, lots, lots, lots of parties and movements are wrestled with that. There's no, there's no sort of magic, magic sort of cure for that one. And I think, I think fundamentally the, the, the underlying thing, of course, is just that the, those parliamentary representatives need to be need to be connected to and come from ongoing yeah. on, ongoing ongoing movements that, that that hold them to account in the way that that Max said, and I think that just points to the fact that we, in my opinion, we are still on a you know we're still on a stepping stone in Australia towards trying to forge what what I think we need to exist, what needs to exist in Australia is a is a genuine sort of uh, anti capitalist pole in Australian politics, which 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 draws together. Um, that's 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 connected to real grassroots struggle, and then draws together the best of you know, draws on uh, the best of the socialist movement, Greens who are drawing anti-capitalist conclusions, like um, obviously people in Brisbane are um, unionists who can be, you know, who have who have a vision for transforming beyond the fossil fuel industry and rejecting the kind of anti-refugee racism that's defined so much of Labor Party politics and other and other community activists and indigenous activists. If all those threads can be can be brought together to create a real, you know, a real political fighting force that's also connected and leading uh, struggle on the ground, then then that's 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 going to be the condition where we, where we get the kind of um, the MPs in Parliament that we that that, that we need. All right. Well, I hope we're not taxing people's time too much, but there's one more question I wanted to ask, which was, I, mean, I guess, especially to Max in particular. Um, and I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to put words into your mouth in terms of, um, you know, to what extent the, the South Brisbane Greens are, you know, a different or whatever to the, to the rest of the Greens. But, um, uh, you know, I think it is true to say that you've been putting forward a more radical vision than, than has been generally the case from the Greens. Mm. So I guess my question is, if you do get elected, what's that going to mean in terms of discussions within the within the Greens party room? Um, I, and I guess I'm thinking about particularly about tricky questions or else questions where some sections of the Greens might want to compromise and maybe you don't. Um, and I, I guess I'm particularly thinking about things like, um, uh, you know, the... The, the carbon price in the, the last time the Greens were in a power sharing arrangement with Labor. Mm. Um, I mean, in my opinion, that was a, uh, a very flawed policy, even though, I mean, going back to what you said before about, um, you know, one of the things about Australian politics is because the, because the offerings are so miserably pathetic, yes. <laughs> that people's expectations are so low yes. that uh, any, any political force that is prepared to offer anything <laughs> is going to have a certain base of support. But I mean, like, there still is the question of how do we actually solve the actual problems that we face, and I guess, and particularly climate. But yeah, but it's not, but it's not only limited to climate either. Yeah, yeah. In terms of the Queensland Greens' difference to the rest of the party, I like. I think there's definitely like we've definitely taken a, a slightly different political, uh, both political and strategic approach. What I would say is our success in using that has led to other. Um, state Green parties around the country and the federal party starting to um, think about at least adopting a lot of those strategies and politics. And um, I think you can see that influence, for instance, on targeted, like the billionaires tax and, you know, wanting to tax 50% of, uh, I think it's a, if it's 50 or 70% uh, windfall gains tax on billionaires um, over the last year. That, those sort of policies, uh, for instance, uh, um, I think as a result of the influence of the Queensland Greens success, because, you know, there's a lot of people in the Greens who I think share our politics, but are afraid that adopting that sort of for that far more, I suppose, like forthright approach, um, <laughs> radical in many ways, uh, is uh, that, that it's a path to, to losing. And that we have won with that, I think, has emboldened people to do that. Just as importantly, strategically, we're also different. 
from a very practical perspective, we attempt to go and talk to people and have long-form discussions about their lives and persuade them to our politics and strategy, not something done at a mass scale anywhere else around the country. And we're currently in discussions about running cross-state trainings to essentially provide that training and capacity to the rest of the party. In terms of if I were to be elected and the influence that I'd have, I mean, I think the federal party room has changed a lot over the last few years. Um, you know, people like Lydia Thorpe, who's fantastic, elected down in Victoria, um, and uh, First Nations, first First Nations um, woman elected to Victoria from the Victorian to the federal Senate from Victoria, I think, and. Uh, I think also just the general political views of the Australian Greens has shifted a lot to the point where I think there's not going to be, I don't anticipate to be there to be many conflicts around those sort of, um, those sort of strategic questions that they have in the past. I, th I would like to hope that if we were to win Griffith, that's unprecedented. The Greens have never won against an incumbent in a federal lower house seat. Um, that, and if and that model works and the politics that works, I think that will hopefully have an enormous influence on how the rest of the party relates to politics and strategic questions. Because all of a sudden, it's our strategy that worked. And surely then, the, the logical outcome of that is that provides an enormous political weight and argumentative weight to adopt that strategy at a national level. Um, and so I suppose, in a, um, as diplomatically as I, as I can put it, I think that will enormously assist debates, for instance, say, if they were to occur in party room. Um, but my strong, my uh, cards on the table really honestly believe that that uh, far less likely than, say, it would have been five years ago. Mm. Okay, yeah, well, thanks for that. I think, I mean, Sam had another commitment, which is, I think that's, I think Sam's had to leave. Um, but that's more or less into the, the questions that I had. Is there anything else you want to say before we finish up? Um, I want to say fantastic chat and I think also like obviously we've got our project running here um, in the Queensland Greens um, but it's like I want to move away from that sort of sectarian nature of progressive politics where we assume that one can only exist while the other doesn't thrive and I'm a big believer in a broad ecosystem um, of progressive movements and politics uh, that can coexist, have different strategic orientations um, but not be in conflict with each other, which I think is obviously, you know, um, the um, left famously not fantastic um, in that sort of perspective or like progressive politics in general. Um, and we're obviously experimenting with a strategy that in the long run may not work. And it's probably good that other people pursue other political strategies and tactics because we're sort of feeling around in the dark at the moment for what comes after the collapse of mass workers' movements in the 20th century. Um, and so while we feel like we've happened upon a strategy that really can win and, and change Australian, fundamentally change Australian politics, it doesn't mean that it's the only thing that should be happening. Mm -hmm. And people should be building social movements and people should be doing this other stuff. Because um, if we get down in 18 years' time, we, get, we start knocking on the door of government, but no one else is around us who's done anything else around social movements or done any other work to build up that ecosystem of progressive politics, then we're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, so keep doing you know, that other stuff as well. Um, but if um, you are involved uh, in and around um, Queensland or Brisbane and you want to get involved, please do, because we don't really mind about what your political affiliations are otherwise or anything like that, um, as long as you share our broad views and values and you should get involved and give it a go. Okay, well, that's a good note to finish on. Um, I should point out Social Science will be running a Senate ticket in Queensland, so we'd love your support on, on that. But certainly from my point of view, 100%, I, um, you know, I'm you know, i cheering on uh, Max to win the Cedar Griffith. I think that would be a fantastic development in Australian politics if that happens. Um, so thanks, Max, for joining us today. Thanks to Sam for joining us. And um, thanks, everybody, for, for watching or listening to this. Um, and we will see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.